Hello, everyone, and welcome to I Don't You Love Live, the um, streaming platform where you can listen to classical music and all of all sorts. Uh, my name is Anders Nyqvist. I'm a member of the Klang Forum Wien. I play the trumpet, and I did this a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, with the magnificent uh, Enno Poppe, a German composer. And today I am uh, joined by the equally magnificent uh, Bas Wiegers, uh, uh, violinist and foremost conductor that um, was born and raised in Holland and now enjoys an international career. And the first uh, concert that we did together was in Graz in 2014. And since then we enjoyed many, many um, concerts and musical moments and he also um, became the principal guest conductor of Klang Forum in uh, autumn 2018 if I'm, if I'm correct. So uh, welcome Bas, really nice to see you. How are you doing? Thank you, thank you. Great to see you. Yeah. Um, since I, uh, we known each other You've been speaking about flow, um, not so much musical flow, but a flow between the artists on stage and the audience. Um, would you please uh, clarify or explain a little bit what you mean with this? Um, well, I've, well uh, I've always been interested in, um, in uh, how music comes, you know, from an idea via a composer, via a musician, maybe via a conductor in the middle, uh, to the audience. And um, I, one of the things that I'm, I'm occupied with in, in what I do and when I conduct, in, in when I work, um, is to try to uh to make sure that this the this energy this this these sound waves that music is um actually goes from the musical idea via all these people uh to the audience without you know without trying to interrupt this and this is this is what i mean by by flow so i when when i talk about this or when we talk about this it's um i don't mean so much only the flow from the from the um, stage to the audience but i mean also the flow from the conductor to us uh, also the flow from even the very first you know the the beginning of the from the music into the composer so to say um and uh why i'm really busy with this always is that um uh if if for some reason in one part or the other of this whole uh you know of this whole trajectory um there is some sort of barrier and you don't is that english barrier yeah and you don't get past it then it it sort of doesn't it doesn't work it doesn't get to the audience and this is this is why this concept of you know the the energy the sound waves going from one body to the other, or one mind to the other, is so important to me. Yeah, is it has it also something to do with the, the extreme energy that happens on stage, that there that should be somehow also transformed into the audience by by and not have this clear cut that there is the audience and then there the the musicians or the artists. Absolutely, I mean. Um, Absolutely, but um, it's not only the energy going from the stage to the audience, it's also the energy going from the audience to the stage, um, which is so important for anything we do. You, we, we, we all know that we can, we can prepare a concert and we have a decent last rehearsal and you know, we all know what the music you know, should more or less be, but still you don't know really how it works until you feel the tension in the hall, until you, and until they participate, so to say. I remember, maybe as a little anecdote, um, uh, um, 
Simon Rattle uh, did the beginning of um, um, slow movement of a Mahler symphony. And now I don't remember which one, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, and the audience would just not really stop coughing, you know, so there was no concentration in the hall. And, you know, he turned around during the concert and instead of saying, shut up and you should be quiet because we're playing Mahler for you, he said to the audience, um, we need your cooperation to make this music happen. And, uh, and so also, it's so beautiful. It's so wonderful that, you know, he, he took it from that side, not like, okay, you have to shut up because you, you know, you have to be in awe and we, ha we worked so hard to make this for you. No, it's not this. You need to participate and we need you to be able to do this. And, and so the flow goes all the, all the directions. And also, you know, it's not only when a composer is present, we are, we are so happy that we work with a lot of living composers. It's not only that they come there and they have their idea and they listen to you and they tell you how it's done. No, you play something for them and they can also be inspired. We had a couple of wonderful, you know, composers the, the last weeks talking to us uh, via this medium. And, uh, and they were all, they were all, you know, people with a two way uh, communication. So you have an instrumentalist, you have a composer, maybe you have a conductor and we all, are busy with this one thing is is to get this uh, this music sort of rolling. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you remember um, one moment in the let's say with Klangform the last couple of years where you've uh, found that it worked the most efficiently uh, and why it it worked so well. But the can, I can I take two? Can I take two moments? Because <laughs> then I can I can give two examples, uh, yeah. very different ones. Um, the, one example was you mentioned that you spoke to Enno Poppa. I I love Enno's music to bits, and I think he's one of the greatest composers we have around. It's so fantastic, and um, we we once played his piece Speicher. Uh, Speicher one is the only movement I conducted up to now. You've played all of them. A uh, couple of times with Enno, you've played them, and maybe a couple of times with other conductors. But then we got to do it once in Hamburg. And I remember it's a, it's a hell of a piece to conduct. It's really hard. It's also really hard to play. It's everybody, you know, for everybody is really hard, like complicated, so to say. And also for the audience, they have to stay there and they have to be there and they have to. And I remember in that particular concert we had a decent rehearsal and whatever it was not you know we were good on their way but all of a sudden in that concert I had the feeling as if I didn't really have to conduct anything so as if and as if you didn't really have to play sort of you had it was completely effortless and still was really hard music and still you know we we could I could just do enough to make sure that everybody felt comfortable I don't know if it felt like that for the ensemble, but it, this is how I felt about, you know, the communication between the musicians and the and the compo uh, the conductor. Sometimes it's not. I mean, very often in in new music, it, you you don't get to that level of freedom. It's it's really hard, and it I found that a, an extremely beautiful, uh, rewarding example of doing something really difficult and then feeling completely free about it. Mm -hmm. The other, the other one that has more to do with the audience was another show, was a show actually, was more a performance that we did with Stefan Prinz, the, co the composer, and Daniel Lenehan, a choreographer. And it was a dance performance. performance. And at some point, uh, we had like eight musicians or seven musicians and six dancers. And at some point, everybody was on stage. Uh, the musicians were obviously on stage like uh, I was inside them the dancers were all around us uh, there were people you know touching us f from the side the, the audience was also sitting next to us and yeah, the audience we well, have to clarify the audience were on stage with us exactly so the, the idea was this the, sta the stage and the hall were not longer separated but it was yeah. it was one it was one space so to say and and so we sort of transcended, transcended, transcended this kind of concept of uh, distance and in a very physical way, in a very sensual way, almost that you could smell, you know, <laughs> who was next to you. And, uh, and this I found also really, really 
inspiring in a way even even when it's you know can also be a little bit intimidating but it, it was um it was really you know the the, the boundaries were completely gone mm. I, I remember that very well it was, mm. uh, some a special experience because the first half of the piece the audience were in the audience and then for the second piece they joined us on stage which which made the the same and the material of the first part and the second part was quite similar there were differences but quite similar so they had the the experience of hearing it from a, from a uh, from a little bit of a distance and then sit in the middle of it i think that's a, a, a brilliant concept and i think it's a sp very special um, um way and uh, you know to, to go forward as well yeah yeah it was really nice also for uh, to elaborate a little bit at the beginning of the show i was i was completely disconnected from you guys because i was literally in the audience part Mm -hmm. um, so I was actually sort of conducting the audience, weirdly enough. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's funny to say it like that. Um, so my whole function, also my function as a conductor, was sort of taken away from me, uh, which is interesting. It doesn't happen so often. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. I was thinking, like, if you change a little bit, the um, modern art galleries if it's like the Tate Modern or the Centre Pompidou in Paris, uh, they have like masses flocking to see the, you know, the masterpieces of modern art. Uh, that's not always the case everywhere with modern uh, performing art, in this case, music or dance. Uh, but let's talk about music. Now. In what way could we learn from visual arts um, and adapt this to uh, modern performing art? It's a very difficult question because um, of course the two entities are completely different. Um, and it also depends very much how, where, where you play. I mean, Klangform, for example, you have your own wonderful series in, in the Concerthaus in Vienna and you have a, a beautiful, faithful audience that you know shows up every time and doesn't, you know, they they're co they're completely into the group. Actually, they're connected to you. Um, so when when you have that relationship to your audience, then it's really love. It's really easy also to to be you know to be in touch with them and to to keep them interested so, somehow. But um, the big difference, obviously, I mean, is an, an incredible cliche, but the big difference between a music or performance art and, and visual arts is that we, music is completely a time, uh, a time art. It is not there, then it is, and then it is not there. And you have to be there for this bit because otherwise you missed it. And, you know, if you go to the Tate Modern and you, you walk past uh, whatever, Jackson Pollock or, uh, and you think, oh, this is bullshit. Uh, and uh, you walk on and you, and you come back to it and you think, oh, maybe it's not bullshit. And then, you know, you drink a cup of coffee and you come back and it's still there <laughs> and you can look at it for a third time. And of course, this is much harder with music. I mean, it happens sometimes, but the, the, the amount of times that you can hear a new piece, especially new music, like the, the Beethoven and the Mozart symphonies, we can hear them all the time. But you know, before uh, you you've heard a, a pop or a Haas piece uh, a couple of times, you know that, that takes a while. So it's much harder to get this kind of familiarity or this kind to spend enough time with this art, so to say. So to start, that is, you know, that is a real difference that I don't think we sh we we can overcome. What is something that we can maybe learn? Um, is the, the um, or what I always look for, let, let me say what I always look for in, for myself in, in concerts also, is to find some sort of, um, for some art, for art that you don't know, I, I like to feel free. And what I mean with this, with this is that I don't want to feel that I should understand it or that I should listen in a certain way or that I should 
you know, I want to feel curious and open and, you know, welcome, so to say. Mm. And um, sometimes in the situation of concert, this is hard to achieve because you have a concert hall and it's closed and the lights dim and you have to shut up and we have all these forms. And I'm not against this. I'm completely for this because for some music, this is also the only way, you know, to listen to it. But for some music or for some, for an entry to this kind of, to this world, it's not so easy. So I'm always looking for, let's say, for new forms, for new ways to, when I say reach out to the audience, it sounds very stupid, but I mean to, no, to, to, be, to have one, to have, a, again, to have a flow of, you know, of um, uh, willingness, yeah, from, from me to the audience, but also from the audience to me. So they have to be curious and I have to be open. And yeah. sometimes I, f I have the feeling that especially a younger audience who, you know, maybe they don't do their homework and they, they have, or I mean, they don't read about the piece before they come to the opera or they, that we sometimes, we, we uh, scare them off a little bit by being like, this is how it should be. And this is yeah. great music. And even if you don't understand it, it's great music. Uh, yeah. Can I, do you allow me a little, um, a little anecdote that I, when I started conducting, I, of course you, you start doing the symphony orchestras with the family concerts, right? And, and one of the first things I did was, um, was a Mahler first symphony with a beautiful, a beautiful uh, story which was told for kids yeah so the, the and then the kids could of course sing on the Frère Jacques theme uh, later and whatever but um, but uh, there was a storyteller and he told the story and then one of the most beautiful moments in the whole piece was when the the storyteller and you have to almost already sort of weep because the story is very sad and then comes this beautiful slow movement uh, oboe solo and afterwards there were a couple of parents and uh, who came to me and said, you know, this, this, I've heard this symphony before, but it never touched me like it did now because you have this entrance. And it, it made me think, it's like, you know, we, we spend, as a conductor, you spend maybe three months or half a year studying this symphony. And then with the musicians, they, we spend the whole week diving into it. And I, you, you give the orchestra all these kind of stupid metaphors of like this should sound like a young girl walking in the green whatever and they look at you as like do you want it louder or softer but uh, you know they you you keep infusing it with inspiration and then all of a sudden you get to the concert and the audience should just get it within half an hour mm -hmm. like they have half an hour and that's you know that they they need to sort of get it and then this is with Mahler so they most people sort of maybe know it but let alone when we do you know a, 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 a popa piece or a has piece and nobody has ever heard you know of anything in this language then so so one of the things that i am always trying to find is how can you be you know how can you be the the bridge to an entry and it doesn't mean that i have to explain them okay this music is about this yeah. Music is not about any, I mean, it could be about this, could be about next days, so maybe about something else. It doesn't really matter. But to give them something that they can start grasping and then we mm -hmm. can let them go. Do you remember, sorry if I, I'm talking too much, but anyway, do you remember uh, this, um, of course you do, the, the, the Bernstein uh, explaining Beethoven, you know, he was sitting behind the piano I grew up with this when I was a kid. This was all over the television, and he would sit behind the piano and he would play the melody, and then he said, "And then this happens, and then this happens." And as a kid, I was like completely compelled, like looking at the screens, like, "What is this guy doing with this music? It's fantastic!" Mm -hmm. And and this kind of um, gateway, this kind of this, this is so fantastic if you can be that. Great. Um, okay, further on. So how do you see like our art form uh, evolving in the near future? Uh, or w where would you like it to, in which direction would you like it to grow? It's really hard to, to say something about it because um, I'm not a composer, you know? So I, the, the, 
the art itself i don't know where the, where they where those weird composers are, will will take us um what i can do you know i we're performers i i don't even like so much the the term musician i i prefer to be a performer you know to because it it makes sure that we've we've all felt like the the past three months we've been we've been in this lockdown that we we are not musicians anymore i mean we can be musicians at home we can still play our instruments but we we are not performers anymore so we we are completely you know um, decapitated somehow um so anyway so uh, as a performer um i really would like um to uh to get into a i mean let me put it a different way uh, sometimes as a performer i feel uh that we are limited too much i i i like to be sort of free and taste everything and and you know i i love mozart and i love monteverdi and i love enopop and i love georg friedrich Haas and i you know and, and I want to do all of this, and sometimes I I have the feeling that we are too much boxed in this kind of direction. Like now, I have this lovely uh, collaboration with you guys, and now all of a sudden I'm a contemporary music specialist, where <laughs> I never thought about music in this way, you know. And the same is for you. I'm sure you can you 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 love to play, uh, you know, also a nice Handel uh, Oratorium every now and then. Maybe you did. I don't know, and. Mm. And and we are all the time. We are sort of caged in this. Okay, this is your specialty, and this is your specialty. And yeah. and it's even worse. I mean, I can live with this because of my job. So whatever, don't complain. But for the audience, I think nobody listens this like this anymore. You know, we we all have this Spotify's and the YouTube's and the iDajos and the you know all these kind of platforms that all this music is present. So the fact that we are going to a hall to listen to only new music and to go to another hall where you have to dress up differently and to listen to a different kind of music. I, I find this by now becoming a little bit unattractive. So for me as a performer, I would love to, to use the next, whatever, two, three decades to sort of get rid of this, you know, I'm, we are all specialists of this, like we are, we are kids of the specialists. Mm -hmm. yeah? The generation before us, they would, they needed to be specialists, you know, Anuncourt and, and whoever, you know, they needed to be, and, and Boulez, they needed to be sort of, uh, but, you know, who cares now? We, we, we know about the gut strings, we know about the Baroque bows, we know about, you know, the, uh, and we can also count until seven and play a decent quintuplet. So we can do, we can do all of this, I think. Yeah. I mean, I heard this from other people too. I'm not sure if I, if I agree, but they, they, they have said that the orchestras or, or ensembles of the future are the ones that kind of do everything. I, I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not I, against... I haven't really uh, thought this through. Uh, I'm, I'm not against... Uh, make, the, a, make your opinion there, but... Uh, so I'm not against this, this wonderful specialism that some Baroque ensembles and also a, a, a wonderful ensemble like Klang from Wien has. Um, but I just think that it can also evolve again. And also, um, I also mean that the, the taste of the music that needs to be written in the coming years yeah. will also be wider. So I'm not saying that the music cannot be the new music, for example, for Klang from but um, it will be music that has a wider scope, that has more performative aspects, that has more, uh, that goes sometimes back to tonality. That go, no, you know. I mean, what you mentioned now is the, the problematic also of the term new music. Of course. The new music, I mean, a, a hundred year old music is also labeled new music. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, which is of course ludicrous. <laughs> uh, but so, yeah. I, I did my violin exam and I played uh, Bartok violin concerto. No, I, I played a lot of new stuff. And then I also played Bartok violin concerto. And the, and the whole school was like, what the hell is this guy doing? He's only playing new music. And I was like, Bartok violin concerto. 
how is that new music? <laughs> but anyway. So if we try to like bundle this together now, which steps um, should we all take to reach out and connect with the, the uh, audience of the future? To make them like more involved and and in the this magical uh, experience of live music. Also, the key um, to like somehow um, um, keep the 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 wonderful audience that we already have, but also joining in with from you know from with other and make other coming into this this community. I think one of the things, I mean, if I'm going to say that I know the solution to all of this, I, I'm going to, I'm a terrible pretentious nobody. So I, I won't say that, but, um, but what I would like to see or how I would like to think about it is uh, not only do we want to, do we want to connect new audience to ourselves, but we also want to be connected to new audience. So it's not only that we have to, you know, lure them into our concert halls, but it's also that we have to think, you know, who do we actually want to play for? Who is this new audience? Because everybody is talking about new audience. Since I, you know, since I graduated from high school, this was a problem. We need to find new audience. And nobody sort of defines what new audience is oh, it's, still it's, your, your holes are still full so whatever you know maybe it's not a problem i completely agree with you <laughs> so yeah. i don't know but um but what i what i want like the first thing that we we talked about was this freedom but the second thing that is like comp most important to me is is curiosity and it's not only curiosity to make sure that others are curious in me but it's also that I want to stay curious in other people. Mm. So also in other audience, maybe a place like this dance show that we did that I also felt sometimes uncomfortable and that I didn't know what to do. And that, you know, it, I find this also interesting. And, and of course, uh, you know, some music like a Bruckner symphony needs to be played in a big hall and everybody needs to shut up and you can dress up in, in tuxedo is all fine because for this music is fantastic. This really works. And I don't, I'm not sure if you need to really try to find a new audience for that. But, but for me, since I work with, you know, composers who are now 27 and not 45, um, they, we need to be, stay interested in them and also in their, you know, in the people that they hang out with. One of the main reasons why I wanted to be involved in new music was that, you know, I live now. What is it? I, I I did a lot of baroque violin as well, so I did a lot of uh, old music practice, and and you know you get all these dead composers, and everybody knows how to perform them. It's like how do you know? I mean, did you actually talk talk to Beethoven? Or um, so one of the reasons is that f I had friends around who were composers and who were visual artists, and who were, and I was playing this old music, and I was like, okay, so I want to stay interested in what happens now, and not only in the composers but also you know in in the people who are now you know in their 20s why yeah. why would they want to be interested in, in in music at all and and what do i need to do to communicate with them i think that's for me is is so curiosity for myself actually yeah i had two uh, experiences that i could mention that i thought really worked to it was it happened after the concerts. It was the first uh, experience was that we had a meeting or a discussion or, or a, like somehow an, an, um, a dialogue with the audience that wanted to stay after the concert and talk to us about the, the experience of the concert. And I remember in, the, in Greece, in Athens, at the Onassis Center, we, uh, there was this kindergarten mum, no, kindergarten teacher, sorry, that said she had a question she was, uh, to me and she said she would love to, we, I think we played Arpegis, Arpegis. Um, and she said uh, she would love to bring this to her kindergarten group, this music. 
And she asked me, how is the best way to introduce this music to kindergarten uh, kids? And I said, it's, I mean, and this is wonderful. I mean, I, I was so happy to get this mm -hmm. question. It, it's a question that I really, can I, can I, 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 can't, I can't really answer, but, but I thought it was just tremendous. Can I say something very briefly about this? Because it, this is a wonderful example that you give. When I, when I, 20 years ago, no, not 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago almost, I had, um, we had, an, I made a new CD with music by Xenakis and I played these uh, violin solo pieces. And I put them on in my brother's house. And my brother had three kids. Uh, uh, one of 16, one of 14, and one was just born. She was like two or whatever, or one and a half. And I put it on and you hear this Xenakis lines and whatever. And my brother sort of stepped out after whatever, 10 seconds. He was like, okay, I, I don't really get this. I know, you know, I know it's you and I love you, but I don't really get it. And the, the 14 year old, she was like, okay, this is weird, but sort of cool. Mm -hmm. And then she lasted a little bit longer. And the, the two year old, she was there the whole time, like, what is this? You know, she was completely into it. It's like, what am I hearing? And this curiosity, I think, I think it's easier to play a pergis for kindergarten kids than to play a Mozart symphony, because then you have to start explaining them about sonata form and, you know, they have to understand much more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and let's that, do it for kids. Yeah. yeah. And the other, the other uh, example that I had was, in Salzburg, after we played a, a concert of Gerard Grissy uh, piece, and I did a, I met, a, it was like 200 teenagers on a summer business school um, course in Salzburg, and they were all, they were all at, the, at the concert. And afterwards, we, some of the musicians went and talked to them, and and answered questions. And the questions and the reactions that they had, these hundreds of teenagers really, were just so fresh and so, uh, yeah, so, so, um, so contemporary. Mm. Yeah. Not that they had no clue what they just heard, but they had a lot of feelings, you know. Better, they were please part. don't understand. <laughs> what? Please don't understand. Yeah, 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 exactly. So they had this, it was a, just a, also a wonderful experience. I think that could be a way forward because then you get a community that also has a little, they're somehow involved. Because mm. it's very hard to do before the concert. This in, in, to inform the, the audience about the pieces and, and so on is uh, before a pre-talk of, of concerts. It's, it's all very good and it sh should not be, be, um, be stopped. But for them to have an actual active role after the concert, I think it's a uh, could. Uh, the could best thing, I think, the best thing would be to have a short concert, then to have a lunch all, all together, and then to do the concert again. That would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, we should never underestimate the curiosity of, of, uh, of uh, people, and young people or, or just everyone. Yeah. yeah. And uh, any, any entrance also, I mean, sorry, if the, but any entrance to a piece is good because both examples that you give is like they, they don't understand what they've heard, but it's, it's fine. I mean, who understands? I don't know. I don't understand what I heard. It's, it, it's nice that I know that Eno Popo works with fractals and that, you know, how he makes his, no, but I don't really understand, you know, what happens. I don't think Eno even would say that he understands his music. So, so there are so many different possibilities to, to enter a piece and, and you don't have to, you don't have to grasp it or whatever. Oh, you don't need to understand it. If it evokes a feeling, then it's right. I That's don't. why it's music. No? Yeah. True. All right, guys, uh, I'm going to um, wrap this up now with a quote, the, uh, the marvelous Monty Python for something uh, completely different. Uh, what in this lockdown now, what was the one thing you did that you would not have done if there would oh. have been, not been a lockdown? Oh, God. Um, I spent hours working on my German. Oh, all right. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Bas. Thank you so much for this. And uh, I'm looking forward to see you very soon. Yes. I'm going to now, uh, next week, my colleague Bernard Sachhuber is uh, mm, mm, having an interview or a talk or an Idagio uh, live stream with uh, the founder of Klang from Wien. Uh, the uh, great, great Beat Fuller, and that one should not be missed. So I hope to see you. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you.